Um, today's uh, Zoom session is in collaboration with uh, two other art groups, Art Kibbutz and Jada Arts. Um, art Kibbutz is the only uh, Jewish international artist residency that exists today. Its mission is to provide a meaningful connection to Judaism among visual and performing arts and writers, many of whom have no Jewish um, affiliation. My name is Jona Werer. I'm from the Jewish Art Salon. I'll tell you about that a little bit more later. But for now, I want to introduce our other collaborator, which is Jada Arts, um, represented by Jonatas Hyman. And just so you know, I've muted everybody except the presenters for now. And once we get to the question and answer, I will unmute everybody. So, uh, Jonatas, say a few words about Jada Arts, please. Definitely. Jada is a grassroots organization founded in 2019 under the Wondering Masters Art Salon organization. Jada's goal is to discuss and contribute to the discourse on metamodernism uh, while creating opportunities for artists to develop via artists in residence programs, art summits, art exhibits, and artistic collaborations such as the one we have here today with the Jewish Art Salon. So thank you very much, Yona, for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Thrilled to have you here. Um, you. Before we actually get started with the program, I just wanted to tell you that our second presenter is Hillel Smith, and I'm going to officially introduce him when his session starts around 1.30. But for now, he will give us a few tech details about this Zoom session. Hillel, please. Uh, take it away. Uh, so while uh, Lenore and I are, are presenting, uh, I will be presenting a series of slides and I, I believe Lenore will as well. Mm -hmm. In the past, we noticed that uh, some attendees have had a problem with the, uh, the panel that has all of the participants in it covering up some of the text on screen. And so when the screen is shared uh, and all of our slides, um, the way you can make sure that the list of participants is not covering up part of your screen. Uh, on the top middle of the Zoom window, when the screen is shared, you'll notice a drop down. And so on the drop down, click side by side view, and that will make the uh, shared presentation just slightly narrower and allow the presenters to be on the side and not cover up the presentation itself. Um, another way to do it, if you prefer, you can also, from that same drop-down menu at the top of the Zoom window, uh, select exit full screen. Uh, exit full screen will have the participant window separate from the presentation. Uh, you can also add the chat and have the chat and have multiple columns up and nothing will cover the presentation itself. Uh, and hopefully uh, no one will have uh, any issues looking at the presentations and seeing the full slides uh, without anything being covered up. Great, thank you so much, Hillel. Um, so I'm Yona Verbe, the co-founder and director of the Jewish Art Salon. We are the world's largest Jewish visual arts organization, established in 2008 and based in New York City. We're a global network of contemporary artists, curators, art historians, and art writers. We have organized exhibitions, art events, etc., in the United States, Europe, and Israel. Um, at, on this date, we have organized over 60 different art events, workshops, interactive events, exploring contemporary Jewish themes related to current issues. Um, just one little plug for our next program. Although we focus mainly on visual art, we are co-sponsoring this Tuesday night at 7.30 New York time, um, a session with one of our members, Julian Wolloch, in conversation with author A.J. Sidransky, who will discuss his new novel, The Interpreter, which questions Jewish identity, who defines it, as well as the world's um, reactions to uh, refugees during World War II. That Zoom link was provided in a newsletter, and it will also be posted later today on social media. All right, so we are starting with Lenore. Our first presenter is conceptual artist Lenore Mizrahi Cohen. She's been a Jewish Art Soul member for many years, has participated in several of our exhibitions. The last one being Spinoza, the exhibition we did last year in Amsterdam. Um, we know Lenore from the New York area, Brooklyn, but last year she relocated to Jerusalem. 
she will give a taste of um, what uh, the artist life was like in Jerusalem uh, before and during the coronavirus, and she will discuss her recent work. Now, her, um, her session may uh, run a little longer, and if that's the case, then we will save her question and answer for after Hillel's session and Hillel's question and answer. We'll just play it by ear. Okay, Lenora, take it away. Okay. Thank you, Yona. Hi, everybody. And thank you also for being here and for your interest in what I have to say tonight. Um, mainly thank you to the organizations for providing this opportunity for all of us, because as any artist knows, such opportunities are nowadays very few and far between uh, to exhibit and present work. So this is a big deal and even a motivator for me, knowing that I had this coming up in a few weeks to even continue creating work at all. So thank you. Uh, as Yona said, I am a, originally a Brooklyn area artist and I recently relocated this year to Jerusalem. Uh, aside from all the personal reasons that I had for moving here, you know, I, I love it. <laughs> um, also, a big part was the very vibrant art scene that I was surprised to discover here throughout um, all my trips and work trips to the city. And I really felt ultimately that I could do my best work and be very supported in that by fellow artists, arts organizations, and even the city itself, the municipality is very supportive of contemporary Jewish art. Um, so I thought that I would start just by giving the story of what brought me here, um, the circumstances, what am I doing now that we're in this situation, although even thankfully now we're already coming out of it here in Israel, which I'm very thankful for. I had to readjust this talk several times as the situation kept changing almost daily, what we were allowed and not allowed to do. My outlook and what I expected for the future was literally changing and shifting daily, but we're in a hopeful good place now here. I'll get more into that later. Um, and then finally, if we have time at the end, I hope you're going to look at me a uh, seven minute warning shot, I would like to open the discussion to where do we hope things will progress from here within the art world for working artists now that we are hopefully passing panic mode and trying to rebuild and um, so hopefully we'll have time to get into that. So I'm going to share my screen with you. Okay. Um, okay. You. Yeah. So this is a very happy picture of me <laughs> in Jerusalem in 2017. Uh, this was the first time that my work, once I made a conceptual work and not only decorative, got its first real exposure. And prior to this experience, creating and producing a show that participated in the Jerusalem Biennale, I actually had a residency with them the year prior, which introduced me to many important organizations within the Jerusalem art scene. And that ultimately really inspired me to make a move to Jerusalem. Um, just the fact that the Biennale even exists is a big deal, I think, for contemporary Jew Jewish artists around the world because it gives us a place to aspire to send our work and it inspires me to keep creating it. So, um, sorry. Another organization that really is special and worthy of mention here in Jerusalem is Beta. They are a gallery near the Shuk Machane Huda area, and I did a residency with them also recently that was supported by the municipality itself. They paid to fly in artists from around the world and create street art in the streets of Jerusalem, and that was exciting. This space is a, an alternative artist space in that they completely reinvent the space every show that's mounted. Their curator, Avital Wexler, uh, is visionary in that way and helping artists realize their their visions and they have workshops in the upstairs floor, carpentry uh, workshop in the back. It's just like one of these quirky, unique spaces in Jerusalem that I was very pleasantly just surprised to discover. I, I didn't see the likes of that in New York and I felt that it was exciting that there was existed an institution that would be interested in the same topics as I was that I could come to with my ideas and have a hope of actually having exposure for them which again is in the New York art scene it, it's such a vast universe full of so many voices and trying to find a foothold and it can be challenging at times not that it's not possible but um, for me and the type of work that I do that this was this was exciting to discover um, another thing about the Jerusalem art scene is that it's very independent, it's a can-do attitude, very grassroots. Uh, they may not have a lot of galleries and a sales scene per se, but they have a 
really committed, authentic voice in that the artists really care about what they're doing and they're doing it not only for monetary reward and if they feel something needs changing in the city, they just go ahead and do it. Uh, this organization that I would draw your attention to here, Muslala, was a group of artists who cared about the environment and uh, earth art. They took over the roof of an abandoned building in the city center and refurbished the whole thing on their own piece of wood by piece of wood until they made it into an artist hub, which also has plantings and sculptures on the roof and they do events throughout the city. And again, just this exciting, there's always something happening, there's always something new to get involved in and it's very welcoming and open. And so that's why I moved to Israel. And I waited many years to be able to come and finally make this move. Um, the last organization that I'll mention because I'm involved with them now is Studio of Her Own. They started as an organization to support uh, women artists from religious backgrounds specifically who they felt were not getting a lot of exposure in the contemporary art world and they eventually expanded to become a center, a hub for women of all backgrounds working in contemporary Jewish art all over Israel. They are the only women's artists collective in Israel. And what I found to that be unique to them and in the world, the way I discovered them was I was searching for residency programs that I could join as a young mother artist several years ago. And they popped up because they had this unique feature where they wanted to bring in resident artists, but also with their children and have provisions made for people that needed to think about housing for a family that would have to come with them. And I that was really exciting to me because you know at that crossroads time where you first have kids and you think well can i even still viably do my job and you see something like this and it tells you you know you can fully invest in both areas of your life you don't have to put one in the box in order to fully flourish in the other and there is something out there for you that was really important to my development as an artist even if i didn't have anything to do with them because it was always watching from afar um they run shows with women from all backgrounds and religions too. They had a embroidery show with Palestinian artists uh, two years ago. This year they were granted a building by the municipality in order to really ramp up their operations. And that's part of my story too, and we'll get back into it after. Um, before, right before I left, I had a solo show at Black Diamond Gallery in Williamsburg, which I'm mentioning because I didn't want to make it seem like there is an opportunity for work like mine to be shown in Brooklyn and in New York. Um, I really enjoyed my time there as an artist. I just felt it was time to move on. Um, I'm just going to quickly skip through this because I do want to have time to get into the Corona stuff. So here we moved to Israel in August and we hit the ground running with the art stuff. I was so excited. I finally made it. I've been waiting years to come here and get involved in this really vibrant active art scene and Hillel Smith, who you'll have the pleasure of hearing from soon, organized this Jewish street art festival that participated in the 2019 Jerusalem Biennale. I was really excited to be a part of that and um, I met some great artists. All the things that I was looking forward to doing once I got here, I got to do immediately, which was also something of a challenge having moved countries less than a month before and all the associated um, craziness that comes with that. But pushed through anyway, had some great experiences. When, this is me uh, working on a lift for the first time. That was pretty terrifying, but ultimately uh, a lot of fun, very satisfying. Uh, this is Chutzot Hayotzer. It's a famous artist colony street right outside the old city walls. And all the artists participating in the show gave their take on a day of creation. So most of my work draws from the visual language of the Islamic world. Uh, being a Syrian descent myself, I, I draw heavily from my heritage as a Syrian Jew in most of my work. Uh, so even when I'm doing something floral, I try and pull from imagery from that area because it's really what speaks to me the most and I use it here. <laughs> uh, a big part of my work involves Arabic calligraphy as well. And this is also a part of the Jerusalem Biennale 2020, uh, 2019 show that we did. This is the Schechter Institute. This was a collaborative work organized by Hillel of calligraphers of multiple languages from throughout the country. And it was exciting to take part and just fully let my art flourish on the wall and have its voice and have its moment in the spotlight, which again is um, not something I've never done before, but as much as um, <laughs> I like this the right way. I love my family very dearly, but having uh, kids and responsibilities at home, it, it is, as much as I love them and love caring for them, that is an actual physical impediment to just fully jumping in with both feet to art all the time. So opportunities like this, where you get to do that and just 
put things up on the wall in this very immediate way and garner immediate response, it's exciting. And it was a, a really nice time for me, despite the difficulty in participating, because like I said, I had just moved. So that's why I pushed to do it. Um, after that ended, I was in talks with Sipi Mizrahi, the director of studio of her own, to move into their new building. But things were moving a little slower than she had anticipated, and they just hadn't been granted their new space yet. They had it identified, and she'd been working on it for years, but things had been getting held up in the government, whatever. I said, okay, it's out of my hands. This is something I'm very practiced at doing, is waiting and finding uh, ways to have creativity in just smaller snippets of time in little ways if you're not in a situation to full-fledgedly let it flow. So I spent time, I said, I'm going to lean into what I can do, which is um, take stock of my surroundings, get used to where I am. And another reason for moving to Israel is that it's just so visually appealing and beautiful and special. So I, it's something I do when I don't have an ongoing project is I'll do a walkabout and just draw architecturally interesting buildings that are around. And there's plenty of opportunity for that. This is in, in Jerusalem. This is the old city, the Churva Synagogue in the Jewish quarter. I had dropped my son off to school and I had to stick around because it was his first day of first grade. So I said, okay, if I can't go home and do studio work, so I'm going to sit here and draw all day long. And that's not a bad thing. Um, just like shifting and pivoting and then finding ways to create in the small margins of time that are available to you, which I think served me well ultimately in Corona time, something that I had to get used to in real life anyway. Um, this is another photo of a mosque in uh, the north of Israel. I did a lot of traveling during this time to try and continue as I always had just gaining inspiration photos because one thing I believe is important is even if you're not in a position to really create something big, you should always be gathering and taking notes and sketching and photographing for when you are in a position to do something with it. Um, another thing I really enjoyed doing during this time was going around the city and revisiting some of my older street art works. These are works that I made uh, during that residency with Beta Gallery in the Nafla Ot Shuk area. Just really helped me feel comfortable in the surroundings and not feeling so much like a fish out of water as, um, like I wrote here, like a homecoming. So um, I also took small commissions at home and working from home, again, is something that I was used to doing, even though not happily, admittedly. I, I've had studios before and for years now it wasn't practical and I was really looking forward to finally moving into a proper studio space. But in the meantime, I did these paper cut artworks. I sketched again for things that were going to be upcoming, calligraphy for things that were going to be relevant later. Um, finally, move-in day came after months of hold up and waiting. And as you can see, this studio space is a dream. Uh, there's closets here that are bigger than closets I've ever had in my, in my home. Um, when you're used to working at your kitchen table and cleaning up and setting up every time you want to do something and you know that it's limiting your thinking, coming into a space like this can be really liberating and exciting in, in knowing that your creativity has its room to play. Artist playtime is important for developing ideas, at least in my practice, and this was one of the best days for me this year was moving my stuff in. This is the gallery space in Studio Michela. They replace their shows every one to two months and all their curators are working women. And you can find them on Facebook for more info on all the things that they do, but they're really incredible. It's just this really welcoming, inviting space. This is the, if you can see if I'm not blocking, this is the garden space on the side, uh, very ripe for street art. I'm about to do something here in the next month, hopefully. Uh, like I said, things are starting to open up. Thank God. So this is my car bringing in my supplies. Finally organizing supplies in an actual closet for once ever. <laughs> this is like the silly little things. They're very exciting and big deal to me. This is Sippy, the director, putting up the mezuzah in the new space uh, the first day that it was open. Just a really exciting time. It's like the culmination of the waiting and the preparing and like, wow, we've arrived. We're here. So let's, again, hit the ground running. Let's do all we can, right? Um, one of the first things I did in the space was just lay down this massive canvas on the floor. It's taller than me and stretch it. Not even because I had something to do with it yet, but I just needed, felt the need to do something big. So this is larger than I am and it's in the studio now. I stretched it. I started taking on commissions from um, more high profile clients. This is a paper cut that I did on commission for one of the more well-known builders of 
modern Jerusalem. They're called the Achim Hasid brothers, and they are responsible for much of the changing skyline in Jerusalem. And so this artwork is comprised of many buildings that they themselves created. I also had access to bigger and better tools. Uh, light is really important in my work, and there was this massive light box that came with the studio, so I set right into using that. Uh, this is the atrium of Bar Ilan University. I was invited there by one of the department heads who is supposedly still, I don't know, because of Corona. Um, they were commissioning me to do a trilingual calligraphy mural in their entryway of the Judaic Studies Middle East Department, an Arabic, English, and Hebrew mural that I started to sketch. Um, and it was just really this time of opening up. If I always had to segment things into a box before, I worked really hard to get here, and now I'd like to go visit other people's exhibitions, reach out to curators that I know of, find new art supply stores. Everything's just outward, branching outward. We're always, I was always in, now that's it. I'm busting out. I'll also mention um, this is the first time because God bless the Israeli child care system that my two lovely children were in school from almost seven in the morning till 3.30 in the afternoon, which when you didn't have a setup like that before is, is very work-wise, it's very liberating. And I felt like there was nothing that I couldn't do with this amount of time. Having kids really teaches you how to use your time very well. If you get any of it, it's gonna be used efficiently and well. So all of this time, it was almost too much. It was fantastic. <laughs> um, I started experimenting with new materials or bringing ideas from the back burner that I had always been thinking of and just never had the space or time to play with. This is the Arabic word for perfect and complete that I calligraphied and then broke apart and switched around just because I felt like I wanted to see what that looked like. And there was never a space or a real reason to do that before I had a proper studio that I could just do it and put it in the corner and forget about it. You know, uh, these are fluorescent paints that I used on black paper and in the corner you see a fluorescent UV light. Uh, I'm gonna show you some work that I did during quarantine, hopefully with the UV light that I have here now in the studio soon. Uh, this time was great for my career, but very tumultuous on the personal side, because when you move countries that is associated with a lot of difficulty, things not going the way you planned, things that are difficult to settle into, and especially in Israel where uh, Hillel can attest, things don't always work exactly the way that you expected them to. Um, so I started this series that my working title for it right now is um, Night Terrors or Let's Face It. Uh, Basically, I felt that this is something that almost everybody probably experiences, or maybe only people with hyperactive brains like mine, that especially in the nighttime hours when there are no more distractions and there's no hiding from your own thoughts, that you have these nagging thoughts or running um, doubts or anxieties that just won't let you sleep and they won't let you alone. You can't stop thinking them, even if you know that they are true. So everyone has these things that keep them up at night. And I said... I realized a long time ago that my most effective art is going to be the stuff that is really important to me, which usually is about heritage and cultural shift and the aftershocks of things like forced expulsion. That's what most of my previous work was about. But if right now this is what's going on in my life and this is what I'm feeling most deeply, then I should probably dive right into it and make art about that, which was a funny new experience for me because I never really made art that was about my personal life before. It was always more about global topics that are important, obviously, to everyone. Uh, so this is something that I felt kind of funny about doing, but I ultimately decided, you know what, I have the studio space exactly for this reason to just play around now and I should let myself do that and I did. Uh, so I thought and conceived of this new series that is going to be comprised of works on paper and canvas and the vision is to eventually when they're all finished, have them presented in a completely dark space that's lit only by the fluorescent light. Everything I'm making is being created with this fluorescent paint. Um, all of them will either have like that soliloquy of things, something that I thought of, or just one simple sentence, or even just one word that can be representative of something that I personally was anxious about, or that is a little bit, I don't want to say enigmatic, but something that can be taken a few different ways so that everyone can take from it what they personally will, because everyone has a different relationship to these things that we worry about at night. Um, one manifestation of this besides the canvas works is something I'm really excited about. And this is what I focused on more heavily during the quarantine time was this um, almost grid of anxieties created out of paper. I picked this symmetrical font and I'm envisioning a grid wall of yes and no questions. And on the reverse side of each one is the word yes or no calligraphied over and over by hand. On the front is a question and it's not a question with a definitive answer like, will I regret this later? 
Yes. Not because that's the real answer to the question. It's about anxiety. It's about what we worry the answer might be. Uh, so it's a little more interesting than a straightforward just questions and answers. Uh, it's more exploring about why do we think that that's true. So I picked a symmetrical font because I think that all these issues we worry about can easily fall to the yes or the no. And this flap structure, because it's almost like turning the page of a book or looking for a hidden answer. And it keeps coming up the same answer with every fold because it's almost like you were worried about it and it's reinforcing your worry. And it might not be the most cheerful um, set of works, but it's real. So I felt like I just shouldn't shy away from making them. And I really worked hard on coming up with a series of questions that work well together. It's a set of 20. I pinned up some of them on the wall behind me and I'll show you them with the fluorescent light later. Um, one thing that's important to me here that I, like, and I think I did successfully, was that in most of my work, I try to make every decision about materials and form fit the function. Because in conceptual art, the idea comes first, and I want to make sure that every decision I make with the materials is helping guide towards bringing out that idea. So I really felt that everything down to the symmetrical font, the folds, and even the colors was an important uh, pinpointed choice. I chose these fluorescent colors and this um, style, not only because we have these thoughts at night and the gallery will be dark and then these will be lit up, but also because I think when we think about neon and fluorescence, we think maybe about the 80s and this cheerful, fun, peppy thing. Um, and in this context, it's almost like a leering at you, like a lurid, false cheeriness that's like taunting you almost, like you're worried about something. Well, you should be. <laughs> um, so I calligraphy them with actually my tools that I use for Arabic calligraphy. I turn them for English. And so there's yes papers and no papers. Even the colors are complementary colors to each other, the red and the, and the green and the orange and the blue. Um, so we had this really exciting flourishing time and then it was gone. This is a photo of my supplies packed up and ready to move away. Um, maybe I got to work in the studio three or four times until it became clear that they were going to order everyone to stay at home. And it wasn't clear how long that situation would continue, whether I would be able to access the studio or not. And I just turned around and as hard as it was for me to accept this and do this, I said, even though I've been waiting for years to have this space, if I'm not going to be able to access it in my materials and I could be at home for the next six months or a year, like who knows what's even happening. It changes every day. So I'm going to have to move it back out. I can't not touch art for a year. I'll lose my mind. So I packed everything right back up and away it went. Uh, back home. I took my laundry room and my guest, my guest room and I stacked everything to the side because obviously we're not having guests anytime soon and I made it the art room. These are my special guest collaborators. Um, it's really cute and nice to involve them in the art process but of course moments like this, you know, 30 minute stretches till the nagging starts. So I did my best to include them and Obviously being at home with the whole family, I don't have to tell you guys because uh, no matter what your family looks like, I'm sure everybody experienced this, that all the things you thought you might do in quarantine kind of have to be put aside in most circumstances because it's more important to keep everybody in the family happy, healthy, whole, and not insane. So most of the time I tried to involve them if I wanted to work just so that we could all happily do something together. As you can see, they're quite young, so it didn't always work out, but I did my best. And that was another thing about this whole quarantine period was accepting that we're just in crazy times. It's not an ideal situation and whatever we can do, we can do and that has to be good enough. Uh, so this is the room I'm sitting in right now and you can see my gallery wall, my kids work. I, I introduced them to the concept of doing that and then they couldn't stop. So they were putting up new things every three minutes. My stuff's all over the floor. It, it's just obviously not an ideal situation but I was very grateful that I did have a room that I could get messy in and, and spread out in at all. Um, so that even in the snippets of time I was still getting, I could still do some work. Um, I did not make much progress or headway, but again, I did something, so that's an accomplishment. <laughs> um, I also learned that experimenting and playing can happen in different ways and reminded myself of things that I knew from before that helped me get through this time was that even if it's not directed at a specific project at this time, you should still keep your hand practiced and keep your mind focused on things that you think are artistically viable, important. And so I did a lot of Arabic calligraphy practice. I experimented with watercolor outside. The rain did a lot of this accidentally, but I like the effect. Uh, one of my favorite days of quarantine was when I literally blockaded the kitchen with furniture so the kids couldn't reach me. I turned off my brain to everyone else and ignored them all day. 
Again, not something you can do every day, but I did it once. Uh, I spent seven hours on that ladder filling in finally this mural that I had conceived of in back in September. And it just sat there uh, penciled in for all this time because there was always somewhere else to go, something else to do, somewhere else to run. And I guess I could thank quarantine for that, that it encouraged me to finally paint it in and finish it. And now I get to enjoy it every day. Um, whether it's going to remind me to actually say this blessing after meals, the jury is still out. So far, no, but that was the original intent. Um, here, I just wanted to also take pause to show, I'm sure that you experienced the same thing in your cities, the biz total bizarreness of all these public spaces being devoid of people. Um, here is one of my favorite features of the Jerusalem art scene from before is the notice boards. It's like the original Facebook wall, except an actual wall. And these are really updated. They're all throughout Jerusalem. And I always used to love passing by them and seeing these different events, festivals, concerts, symposiums, lectures, just on and on and on. There was no shortage of things to do. It was almost like Manhattan in that sense. And it, it was... Even if you didn't get to everything, it just made me happy to see it. And this is the same notice board during Corona time. It's got mostly advertisements for hospitals and hotlines for if you're having medical emergencies and all the events have obviously been canceled and pasted over. Excuse um, me, Lenore, uh, yeah. this is the seven minute mark. Okay, so I will just quickly go through the rest. Um, did my walkabout drawings to help keep me sane. <laughs> This is the bridge spanning the Hinnom Valley, which is outside of the old city near my house. And this is walls in the old city. We weren't really allowed to leave the house except for grocery shopping. And I was pretty nervous while I did these, even though I was wearing a mask, because you can't really pretend you're on the way to the grocery if you are sitting with an open sketchbook. But um, thankfully, I didn't get stopped. Nothing happened. It was fine. And I had to do this for mental escape, because even as it was a tease, having all the art supplies at home, knowing that you're not really going to use much of them, you sometimes had to go in and use it just so you could breathe mentally. Um, so I made this slide here to help get a discussion started with our last five minutes. I, I would like to talk about like the lessons and takeaways from this time because in Jerusalem, we are starting to come out of it. Um, all the arts funding has been canceled for the rest of the year, but the municipality just all, um, announced a new artist opportunity and contest to put their work in the, in the mayor's in the mayor's residence, uh, the studio of her own organization that I'm working with reopened their doors and I hope to move back in, in soon. That's the biggest uh, thing to celebrate. And they also started funding, again, because the arts funding is canceled, the director was mentioning to me, for example, that now they can be less limited in format and what they want to present. So that's a plus there. People are being creative about ways to have shows that are collaborative between artists, even as they're only allowed to have a certain amount of people in the space at a time. There's a show that she just announced, the director, where all the member artists are going to have 24 hours to do what they want in the building, and that show will be up for two months after it's done. Um, for me personally, I learned through this time not to get too hung up on every little change because they're going to change again. And sometimes there's nothing we can do about what's going on and we just have to do our best. Um, but at the same time, if you have something that you really need that you have to be almost militant in insisting that it happens, like locking myself in the studio and working. Um, I'm trying to decide if... No, yeah, we'll go to discussion. If anyone's interested to see these um, anxiety questions behind me, you can always message me afterwards or email me and I'll send you a photo of what I've been working on. It's basically, wait, stop sharing for a second. Just so you can see what these look like in the flesh. The cut paper. Um, I have a fluorescent light here. I guess it'd be silly if I didn't use it for a second and then we'll open to discussion. Just because I'm excited about it, it is the only thing that I... <laughs> did this entire time. Um, let's see. So again, these are not, these are not necessarily a definitive question and answer. It's more about what you worry they might be. And you can see even without the fine detail of being here in person that the effect is really special. It's exciting and being confronted with an entire gallery full of things like this, it would be overwhelming, but I think in a good way. So I put up some of my favorites here. Um, if you can see, can people tell? You know, not all of them are about a direct specific issue. Some of them are open-ended and mean a different thing to each person that reads them, which was my goal. Uh, am I doing my best? That's a no question. Am I giving my child anxiety? Yes. Am I giving my child enough? No. Will I regret this later? Yes. Will it ever work right? No. 
Um, and again, it could be anything. It's your work-life balance. It's your dishwasher that keeps breaking. Um, I'm excited to see where that series will continue when I have the chance to now continue it in large. Um, why don't we unmute everybody and just like open it to questions or anything anyone else wants to say about how they think things might change now that we're coming out of this. Our show check. Good. High 20. Fertilizer high. Can I ask a question? It's yes, please. Hi, I'm Julia. I, I live in Colorado in the United States. Pretty cool. Ready for the back. Hold on one second, because there's a lot of feedback from other people. So I'm going to mute everybody again. And then, Julia, if you could unmute yourself. And then anyone after Julia who wants to ask a question, you know, unmute yourself. Julia, are you able to unmute yourself? Yes. Can you hear okay, me? Great. Yeah. Great. Okay, um, Lenore, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Julia, and this was a wonderful presentation, and I can relate to many, many things you said about trying to balance family and little kids and the sh shutdown. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the, um, uh, how we're shifting our artist presentations now that we can't really have in-person or um, you know, the events that we are used to, the openings and whatnot. Um, there was a really good article in the Denver Post today about this and how artists are responding here in Colorado. We actually had a, an art truck where they put art on a billboard that drove around the whole city. Um, wow. so everybody could see it. It was really neat. Morale booster. Exactly. And then there's a lot of artists working with um, digital presentations. And so I kind of wanted to ask you about what you think the possibilities are in your mind? So I think that as we see things starting to open up, I'm using Jerusalem as a model only because I think it's a little bit ahead of the US in this. They started saying that 50 people can gather in an open space now, for example. And I think things will slowly start opening up and they may contract again. But um, I'm actually looking forward a little bit. One of the things that I put on that slide that I already took down was that I think if less people are allowed to attend a show at a time, that that might take a lot of the hoopla out of something like an opening and put the focus more on the actual artwork, which is something that I think as artists we can celebrate because a lot of times you put a lot of work and thought into something and people come just to party and they're not really paying attention to what's on the wall. If it's gonna be viewings by appointment only or smaller groups at a time and having artist talks in association with an opening, that might not be such a bad thing. And I think it's, uh, everything's looking a lot less drastic now that things are starting to open up again. When we were in the middle of it, it was like, Nothing will ever be the same again. Everything's closed forever. Where are the people? But like, that's not reality. We will come out of it. I just think that some of the changes could be directed towards the good. It's an opportunity now for us. Like that art, roving art you mentioned. Uh, Lenora, I have a question. So you, you mentioned that uh, in the past, you used to focus quite a lot on creating artwork that dealt with explosion, uh, the diaspora, uh, things about your family background. Uh, that is also what I create mostly about when it comes to my Jewish art. Uh, I'm curious, uh, now that we are in this lockdown, going back to your inspiration to create about the diaspora, about exposures, which means you are being uh, literally pushed out from spaces. And now in lockdown, we have to focus on the space within because that's all we have, right? Um, how is that translating? Do you feel that there's a sense of, uh, perhaps there's a compare, uh, comparison or parallel that you can create? Okay, a really short answer, Lenore, because we just finished the seven minute slot. Um, I guess I would just say that um, most of my art that deals with expulsion and immigration and moving around is about historical context. So I don't know that it applies so much in this situation because I don't think we're undergoing any, ex like, I didn't think of it on a personal level. I didn't. I was more just doing, having too much anxiety. <laughs> but thank you for everyone for listening. And I don't want to cut into Hillel's time. So if you do have further questions, feel free to email me. I'm, I'm happy to talk about stuff like this. We've all got time. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Noor. This was really, I don't know if you have been able to look at the chat uh, function, but people have been loving your um, presentation. We are now moving to our next presenter. Much of Hillel Smith's work involves blending ancestral Jewish texts and ritual with contemporary and otherwise non-traditional media. 
such as street art murals with biblical texts and a digitally, um, uh oh, a digitally something Omer counter. I can't read my handwriting. Animated Omer counter. In Rethinking Judaica with New Media, Hillel will present a few projects of his, as well as other historical and modern examples, to attempt to reframe what Judaica can be. Hillel is based in Washington, D.C. and Los Angeles. Hillel, take it away. Thanks. Uh, I've been having some brief issues with internet, so if at any point my audio cuts out for a second, please just uh, let me know and I'll repeat what I just said. So let me do my best to share the screen. So what I want to talk about is uh, a bit about my work and how I approach this. And so when we think about uh, what Judaica is, I think Judaica typically can refer to uh, ritual objects that includes things that we use for the practice of Jewish rituals. So here, candlesticks, um, also Jewish books, and then also decorative wall art that has very clear Jewish content uh, that goes along with it, maybe possibly some kind of uh, Jewish function in the home um, or another kind of display space. And I think uh, the idea of what Judaica is, I think uh, over the course of the last century has really contracted in disappointing ways in the sense that uh, there's a particular aesthetic that most people tend to associate with Judaica and a, a particular mode <clears throat> that uh, this work tends to appear in. And a lot of the work that I do is trying to chip away at uh, this idea of what Judaica is and what Judaica can be and try to bring in other influences, other media and other modes to really broaden this category and to make hopefully Jewish work that is more compelling and interesting and, and more probably reflects the era that we're in. Um, so that includes large-scale street art murals. So this is a piece in Los Angeles. Uh, this is on the back of a kosher bakery. Uh, it says, Hamotzi Lachamin Haaretz, which I thought was appropriate to paint on the back of a bakery. Uh, it's about 20, 25-ish uh, feet tall. Um, I also do a lot of uh, digital poster design. So this is uh, for a series of posters with uh, various blessings. And this one is, Asher Natan Zachri Bina Lachim Ben Yom Uvein Laila. So, uh, Thanking God in the morning for giving the rooster the knowledge to tell the difference between night and day. And so to illustrate this in, in a contemporary way using uh, a digital aesthetic and uh, digital design software. Um, also, uh, smaller construction projects. Um, so this is a Mishloch uh, Manot box uh, that I uh, put together a few years ago. Um, thinking of package design as a form of Judaica. Uh, and then also applying this aesthetic to actual ritual books themselves. So these were uh, a set of uh, wedding ventures that were designed for the weddings and simchas of various friends. Um, and to, again, take this aesthetic out of uh, contemporary graphic design and apply it to Jewish ritual and, and Jewish meaning. And so when I, this is the kind of work that I was inspired by as a kid, re, uh, reading comic books. My grandmother had taken me to uh, Renee Magritte art ex exhibition at the LA County Museum of Art when I was probably about 10 or 11. And it was the most mind blowing uh, experience I'd had in art to that point. Um, and also growing up in Los Angeles, the ubiquity of street art and this the way that uh, art really colors the city. Um, and thinking about how art can interact with the viewer and how art can uh, approach the viewer at, in different ways and uh, in different experiences. And so uh, Mordechai Rosenstein was really the first Jewish artist that I had been exposed to that had an aesthetic that appealed to me based on, uh, as you can see, what my influences were. Um, and someone who had thought about how to deconstruct um, this idea of what uh, you know, Jewish decorative wall art is, um, but applying his own very unique aesthetic to biblical text and uh, making very, uh, I think, easily accessible ritual objects, um, but in a style that I had never seen done elsewhere. And so this is a project of mine. Uh, back uh, in college, I started hanging around in the print studio. So I uh, was hanging out with a, a group called Night Shift. And so this is with leftover uh, Yiddish type of various sizes, most just incorporating found objects together to make interesting pieces. I loved the experience of being in the print studio, working with letterpress and silkscreen, but uh, when I lived in a one-bedroom apartment, 
um, having <laughs> graduated, uh, access to that was no longer available. And so the next closest thing to silkscreen I, I found was spray paint stenciling. So started working in small scale spray paint stencils, so this is a milk and honey piece. And then uh, this is about, uh, I think this is 17 by 11, so fairly small. And then scaling this up to very large scale mural projects. So this is at Camp Ramon, California. Uh, the text says, Upnel Chachaber, acquire for yourself a friend, which working with the camp directors thought this was a, a very appropriate message to have at camp. Um, but also for kids who are too young to read, for people who have, uh, who aren't Jewish or have limited uh, Jewish awareness to think about how I can display this in a way that's bright, that's fun, that's inviting, uh, and that enlivens camp um, regardless of their ability to read the text, but the, hopefully the aesthetic itself conveys that message. And uh, so to consider mural arts as a form of Judaica, create, both creating Jewish spaces, but creating uh, opportunities for people to engage with text uh, and rituals. This is another piece is at American Jewish University in Los Angeles. The text is Ashreya Damatzah Chokmah from Proverbs. Uh, Happy is the person who finds wisdom. And this is a collaborative art piece with an Israeli artist, uh, Itamar Pologe, who did the uh, calligraphy that kind of radi up, uh, radiates up in flames of, uh, over the letter forms. Um, this is a piece in Los Angeles at the Westwood Kehila Synagogue. Um, the synagogue has a, uh, is the home to both an Ashkenazi and a Persian minion. And so we wanted to highlight both the Ashkenazi and the uh, Persian minions by their respective uh, Sefer Torahs in this piece. Um, as Lenore showed, so this past October, uh, over the course, over the number of years, I've had opportunities to connect with different uh, Jewish muralists from around the world and had this idea of, wouldn't it be great to celebrate this growing movement of Jewish muralists by bringing them all to Jerusalem and having this uh, exhibition be part of the Jerusalem Biennale, which is a celebration of contemporary Jewish art. Um, and so bringing this aesthetic to Israel, so this is a piece that uh, Lenore showed, um, this is at First Station, so we had uh, 10 pieces by 10 artists at First Station. Uh, this is at the Schechter Institute, so you can see Lenore's work down below. My work is the big green text on the side. And here, taking this aesthetic of a, a tagged wall, where I have a wall covered in graffiti by a number of different artists, but here, this is on the backside of Beit Midrash, uh, right, a, a, a place of learning, and each artist picked the text that, that reflected something about learning or creation, and drew it in their own lettering style. So this becomes both an analog to what happens in a Beit Midrash of conversation, of interaction, of uh, overlapping voices, of learning, of people coming to this place of learning with their own life experience to, to share and inform the text uh, and the learning that they're, uh, that they're doing. Um, and very also, and reflecting uh, the, let's say the uh, metaphor of a page of Talmud, just as much as it, as it, as it evokes the metaphor of uh, a tagged uh, derelict highway wall. Um, and on the back side of Paul Hode, as uh, Lenore also showed, um, seven artists did seven days of creation. So my day is the first day light and dark uh, up here. And to have this piece of contemporary Jewish art be directly opposite the street from the old gate, uh, the, uh, the old city walls of Jerusalem, uh, I thought it was such an, a beautiful contrast. If you stand where that car is and look up the hill, you can see uh, the, uh, Miguel David, you can see the old city walls, you can get the sense of the, this amazing continuity of Jewish history and the whole breadth of, of the Jewish experience. Um, and so that this idea of using mural arts as a way to uh, express Jewish ideas and Jewish text, I think very related to this idea that we have been seeing over the course of the 20th century of using mural arts to reflect community identities and community ideas. So growing up in Los Angeles in East LA, um, which is an area that is uh, very significantly populated by people from uh, Central and South America, um, the mural arts there reflect the origins of those communities. Um, and the same is true when you go to Little Tokyo with the Japanese influenced pieces uh, on, uh, in downtown Los Angeles, um, in South Los Angeles with the African-American inspired pieces. And so using that aesthetic and that mentality as a jumping off point to create Jewish work uh, felt very appropriate. And this idea of using these archetypes from uh, other communities to inform Jewish work is not a new thing. 
So going back to the Middle Ages, uh, the Christians were putting together illuminated manuscripts and the Jews looked at those illuminated manuscripts and reproduced them in very direct ways. You can see here, this is, a, uh, this is the Ashkenazi Haggadah. Um, they're not only uh, reproducing the idea of an illustrated manuscript, there's a dropped capital in the Hebrew, right? These are people who, there's not dropped capitals in, in Hebrew, but they're using this aesthetic to inform the work because this is a way to venerate Jewish text in a, in a, uh, a visual language that they know. Um, and we also see that in some cases, the uh, Jewish communities use the other art forms as a jumping off point. So uh, here you have a carpet page from uh, Haggadah from Spain, clearly referencing uh, Islamic art forms, but then inventing this brand new art form of micrographic art and calligraphy to you know, use this mode of aesthetic and create something that's very new and very Jewish, specifically out of this. Um, and we often think of Judaica as something that can only be done by you know, uh, professionals, but that's not also not the case. Um, in 18th century Germany, having uh, pewter plates was a nice decorative thing you could have in a home. And if pewter is a soft metal, you can etch it or uh, emboss it to your will. And so Jews saw this, thought it was a great idea, would also buy these, uh, these pewter plates. And you'll see throughout uh, Central and Eastern Europe in the 18th century, um, these pewter plates that were designed by hand by individual Jews for their own families. So here you have, uh, there's a plate for Purim on the left, um, a shiva plate in the middle. Um, on the end, you can see it says basar on the bottom. They're uh, identifying, they're meat and dairy plates. Um, and this idea that taking, there's no reason why we can't take these pieces that are around us um, and put a Jewish spin on it. Once we get into the 20th century, uh, poster design, so as a graphic designer, this is the stuff that really uh, gets me going. Um, integrating the Art Nouveau into forum posters, um, referencing Dada. So if you're, uh, Josef Kantanatowski is living in Paris, 1925, sees this Dada uh, event happening um, and starts using that aesthetic in his work. Uh, think of the Bauhaus and incorporating those aesthetics into this burgeoning uh, Yiddish life and culture happening in Europe. Um, and many of these are artists who were engaged both in the Jewish world and in the outside world, that uh, Elisitsky, as one of the forerunners of the Bauhaus movement, is also doing Yiddish children's books and applying that aesthetic to Yiddish literature and to uh, Jewish culture. Uh, Mark Chagall, before he was the Mark Chagall that we knew, also engaged in this uh, kind of contemporary graphic design, uh, referencing um, constructivism and futurism and other movements happening at the time. Um, and then on the other side of the scale, you also have uh, Jews referencing the arts and crafts movement and bringing in these other kinds of aesthetic, um, backwards looking as much as forward looking into the pieces that they're doing. Uh, and then it's these artists populating the early 20th century who I think are not as uh, highlighted today as they should be, um, but whose work still looks current nearly 100 years later. Um, Ludwig Wolpert's design work for uh, uh, synagogue uh, arcs and uh, ritual objects for the synagogue, for the home, um, his large public works, including the gates at the uh, JFK airport, which no longer exist. Um, now, these look just as fresh now as they did when he made these. Um, I also think of Saul Lewitt, who, again, took this pop art aesthetic and applied it to his work. And when we think about this kind of uh, Judaica, that this is also of a particular time and place, but this is a time that existed 150 years ago. And so why are we still referencing this when we could be referencing newer things? So I've been inspired by uh, Marion Banshees, who every year does a series of uh, Valentine's cards that are new and interesting and different. And so my spin on that was, well, what's the Jewish holiday that I can do a spin on? And so thinking about Purim, uh, doing the Stolk note every year, so this is uh, referencing the part of the, uh, of the uh, Megillah um, where uh, Mordechai is carved around on the king's horse. So these are dum dum lollipops as, as the legs in its own little packaging. Um, one a few years ago is a reproduction of the king's palace. This is based on the architecture of an ancient palace outside of Baghdad. Um, little envelopes, these are all paper cutouts. Um, that text is actually fruit roll, uh, uh, fruit by the foot, sorry, that's uh, behind the open cutouts to uh, give the color. So the, the idea of sending gifts of food, so you're sending food, so I've 
I'd be great to put in an envelope. Um, this is a couple years ago. So this is, uh, you'll see Mordechai wearing the king's crown, a minus three corner hat. The whole point of Purim is Benahafelhu, everything was turned upside down. So the entire box is rotationally symmetrical so that Mordechai turns into Haman when the box turns upside down. Um, the text as well is an ambergram that flips over. Um, this is this year's, so referencing uh, these harem windows um, that we think of and uh, all kinds of architecture all across the uh, Middle East and uh, South Asia. Um, so inside there's candy, a little, uh, a little balloon light. When the balloon light is placed on top, the light sh shines out the windows. And when you look at it from above, um, the shadows from the windows spell out happy porn on the tabletop. So thinking about how we can take these Jewish rituals and present them in, in new and different ways. Um, again, here's a, a Hanukkah menorah that came out just this past year. Um, it's lucite. You can put in actual candlesticks on top. Uh, it also comes with a set of um, uh, acrylic pieces that you can use instead if uh, you want to use this as a you know, lobby display piece. And here again, um, this is an ambergram. So one side it says Hanukkah. Here it is with the lucite. And it flips over to say light facing the as quote the miracle menorah, um, expressing ideas about the holiday through the, the artifact itself. Uh, and we think of other kinds of non-traditional pieces. This is a piece that I worked on with a PJ Library. This is a luggage tag that has a chamsa and has uh, the text of Tulat Hadarach, the Traveler's Prayer, on it. Um, so it says, which go in peace, in peace. In the background of the chamsa, there are different pieces from the Traveler's Prayer itself. Um, happy, healthy, whole, uh, no wild animal, treat us kindly. And on the, on the inside, you can put actual address to make it bunk as a luggage tag. But it's also meant to encourage kids to think about their wishes for the trip. So there's two little pieces. One says, protect us from, one says, make this trip. Uh, and to allow the kids to put wishes for this trip that they're taking. Um, uh, here's another thing. Taking this uh, idea of an illustrated Bible using my appreciation for a minimalist contemporary design aesthetic to create a series of posters for all of the partiot. Um, also indulging my love of typography. So each poster, one for each partial, so 54 altogether, um, each one incorporates the name of the partial in the design and expresses something about uh, my take, my visual midrash on that week's partia. So if we look at Noah, um, on the top second from the left. So you have a water droplet, it says Noach Nun Chet, but then in the droplet, you'll see in the negative space, the Ark. Um, there's the Mount Ararat uh, on the top uh, above the Chet. Um, next to it, you have uh, the so the story of Joseph and uh, his coat. So it starts off with the coat, the yellow stripes spell out Vayeshev, um, and the, this Parsha ends with Joseph in prison. And so uh, that's not to do with his hands holding you know, the bars um, and the implication of that, it's this coat that sets the entire story in motion. Um, and so again, to use this visual aesthetic and this contemporary media to create a new form of, uh, I would say, biblical-based art. Um, paper cutting, we think of as a traditional Jewish art form. And so here, again, I try to think, how can I put my spin on this? So we already saw the... Um, the uh, three-dimensional cut pieces that I've worked on before. Um, and then also think of how can I use uh, my love of typography and uh, old colors to put this together. So these are multi-layer paper cuts, um, it's called an Asian mimes. These are machine cut um, to get really perfect registration between each one um, and to create a piece that has depth um, that works a lot better in three dimensions. And then other artists who uh, I think are doing work that I find to be interesting in this way that can achieve this uh, common purpose of being uh, Jewishly uh, connected, but also very, very much uh, rooted in the contemporary world. Um, Isaac Munyar Bialik, who's actually, I, I believe, speaking right now at a different presentation, um, sees comic book art as a Jewish art form and blends that with his paper cut work. Um, I also love this incorporation of the found objects. Um, I know Fran is watching because I saw her face earlier. So uh, again, 
using found objects, in this case salt and pepper shakers, um, to create new, interesting, and whimsical uh, ritual objects. Um, and also adding in humor. So Ari Kweiss, um, who uh, presents a lot at uh, the Jerusalem Biennale and at Pola Oat, which uh, helped us put together that series of seven days of creation murals in Jerusalem, um, adding a sense of whimsy and humor with this. So here you have sterling silver fish cup that looks like a, a no coffee cup. Um, and using contemporary design to create new uh, Jewish books. So Asufa is an Israeli design collective. And over the last few years, they have been putting out these Haggadahs, which are as much Haggadahs as they are design anthologies, where each artist gets a page spread and a piece of text. And each page is just wildly different from the next using kind of a hipster DIY aesthetic right next to um, a uh, super sharp, super modern uh, geometric uh, vector illustration aesthetic. Um, and I think Reboot has been doing some really incredible work uh, thinking about how uh, Jewish, what Jewish ritual means and then how to create new versions of these objects um, paying attention to uh, our contemporary philosophies about livability and needs and what it is to be a Jew in the modern era. So Sukkah City was a project they did, I believe, in 2011, um, where they commissioned architects from around the world to submit proposals for uh, a new version of a Sukkah. And so this was in, uh, the first version was in uh, here in New York, you'll see in this photo. Um, but this model has been copied by a number of organizations all across the United States, um, each one tasking people to think about how can you make a sukkah that is kosher as far as all the traditional laws are concerned, um, but very much rethinking what a sukkah is, what it can represent, and how to imbue the physical structure with the philosophy of that piece. Uh, Judy Kopelman, um, number one, number of our artists who was in the mural festival, um, has been putting together, part of some sponsored by uh, 929, um, a series of stenciled murals uh, that went up in uh, Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, and I think Haifa, maybe elsewhere, um, taking biblical text and then putting a fun spin on it. So here you have Loto Hayat Adam Vados. So from Genesis, it's not good for man to be alone. And here, uh, setting that off with uh, a selection of teenagers on their phones. Um, and this is art that is so deeply Jewish in so many different ways. Um, and I think blending it with this uh, mode of street art um, makes it public and allows the public to interact with it and to engage with it and to engage with the work, with the text, with the philosophy and the meaning behind it um, in ways that you wouldn't necessarily associate with, uh, with either the kind of Jewish art that you'd seen in a gallery or in a home. Um, which I think broadens the, the purpose of the art, the function of the art, um, the visibility of the art, and I think uh, helps create a new vision for what Jewish community can be um, in a sense of using public art to create Jewish public spaces and public Jewish conversation. Um, and uh, last as a, a case study, I'll talk about Omer captors. So we are currently in the middle of the Omer. Um, and counting the Omer has been a tradition for thousands of years, but also counting the Omer and using a physical object as a tool to help that uh, has also been a part of our tradition. So this is a specifically Portuguese mode. Um, you'll find these different kinds of constructions, but the basic format is the same, that you have uh, three scrolls usually in a box. Um, and so this uh, H is for Homer, S for Semana, the week, and D for Dia for the day. And so it's the 29th day of the Omer, uh, four weeks in one day. Um, contrast that to uh, Italy, where you have this tradition uh, throughout the um, uh, 16th, 17th, 18th centuries of having these very pocket Omer counting books, um, frequently illustrated, also frequently made, uh, illustrated by hand. And so working on this to think, well, how can I take this tradition and add my spin on this. And so thinking about, well, if the Omer is a, I think kind of boring ritual of just announcing a day every day, how can I turn this into a creative opportunity? So sitting down every day and designing and animating a number or a Hebrew letter representing that day. So you have uh, you know, one, six, number seven, the seven turning into a Zion, so representing both the Hebrew and the uh, 
the Arabic numeral, um, some like uh, 22 and 37 down below, trying to exist as both Hebrew and uh, numeral at the same time. So you'll see the 37 is simultaneously a Lamed Zion. Um, and so playing with typography, making something that's active, that's engaging, um, to expand this ritual of the Umar from something that's purely static and reactive to something that is creative. And also something that uh, if anyone would like to, you can go on my website and you could subscribe and you will get an, an, this, uh, a letter of the Omer every day by email. Um, and so thinking, how can I engage uh, not just contemporary technology to create the work, but to distribute the work um, and to make something where the ritual now comes to you and you can open your email at uh, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific um, and get that day of the Omer and count along with me. Um, and so this idea that uh, Jewish uh, art, so Judaica doesn't have to be made by uh, professionals, um, that here's a, a laser cut Omer counter you can find on Etsy, which I think is really geniusly put together. Um, this is one of my favorites, uh, Josh Rosenberg's Pop the Omer. So it's, uh, you can print this out at home and then just put your own sheet of bubble, uh, bubble wrap on top of it and pop the day of the Omer that you're on. Um, and I think this also speaks to this uh, divide between art and craft that we uh, often in, in the art world that there's this condescension from the fine artists against the craft, uh, craft people against uh, you know, uh, fine art painting versus illustration as a commercial work. And I, I think that Judaica allows us to in, indulge in this idea of craft and uh, commercial work because this, these are projects that are meant to be used. These aren't meant to be to go on walls. These aren't conceptual in the way that you go in, you think about it, you ponder it, that these are meant to be used and engaged with um, and interacted with in a way that's very real uh, and very, uh, you know, very traditional in a sense. Um, and so I hope that uh, we can now that we're going into the, you know, the next phase of the future, uh, hopefully post coronavirus, um, to think about how do we engage with our families? How do we engage with our communities? How do we engage with you know, God? How do we engage with ourselves with the technology that we have available to us and continue making Judaica and Jewish work and Jewish objects that connect us both to our past as much as they connect us to our present and the world around us. Um, and if anyone has any questions, uh, I would, love to, to speak a little bit more about it. First of all, Hillel, thank you so much. It's been fascinating. And I will send you the chats to you and Lenore. You can both then read at your leisure all the you know, comments uh, and compliments. Um, to everybody else, if you want to ask a question, please unmute yourself, but only if you are planning to speak. Thank you. Hello. This was, without a doubt, one of the best presentations I've seen on so many different subjects, uh, right? Uh, what, I, what I really love, it's a, first of all, a comment, is the fact that you really illustrated how well um, Jewish arts uh, don't come from a vacuum, right? It happens with a context, and you made it so global, uh, especially uh, being here in the U.S., which is, uh, we have a very narrow view of, of what it what it means to have a Jewish look when it comes to art. And uh, I know one of the goals of everybody here is to change this perception. And you did that in such an amazing way. Thank you so much for this. I don't have a question. I just wanted to say Hazaku Baruch. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah, I, that's exactly what I'm trying to um, That there seems to be this impression that Jewish work has to look a certain way, that we have uh, this idea that uh, Judaica should be Baroque silver or filigree or a certain set of materials and illustration um, that is both not only uh, historically inaccurate, but also very limiting. Yeah. Um, and to think of how broad we can make this if we encouraged everyone to take the aesthetics that are meaningful to them and what connects them to you know, the, you know, the beauty and, and creativity uh, of everyone else in the world and to bring that into their Jewish life uh, as well and to decorate their home with it in a way that doesn't have to fight with the other kinds of contemporary work that we want to decorate our homes with. Hello, I'd like to um, first of all say thank you. It, fascinating presentation. Uh, and, and what you just said, I think is so accurate and, and 
really um, requires even more discussion perhaps in the sense that here in America, uh, as Yonatas said, um, our perception of what qualifies as Jewish, right? Uh, Jewish as a whole, but then especially Jewish art um, has been so molded and dictated by the post-war experience, right? Um, because really the, the uh, having spent a, a few decades myself in, in the shtetl of Muncie um, <laughs> as a Balas Shuva, and that's a whole different discussion, right? Because that's also something that's come out of this post-war experience. Um, but, but it really has informed a whole different view of what existed before, and that view is, in fact, very much warped. And, yeah. and I give you tremendous credit for bringing in those sources, let's say, of the Omer, because there is this notion at this point in the American Jewish community, and especially in um, those who identify as normative orthodoxy, right, um, sort of the gatekeepers of tradition as a whole, in, at least in the view of the world, right? And, and the, the known aesthetics that you brought into your discussion, like aren't even being seen anymore or referenced with, with such accuracy. And so I really just want to applaud you for doing that and say thank you for reminding us, you know, I know Yonatas has a, a very specific mission in um, sort of identifying us as, as we wander through the diaspora and and serving that legacy of weaving these threads, right, that we all bring. But I really just, I appreciate what you brought to, to the table today. So thank you. Oh, thank you very much. And I, I just see in the comments right now uh, from Holly Markoff, who saw me present at the uh, Richmond JCC, one of the things that I love doing when I travel around the country and present at JCCs and, and other institutions is to present a history of Jewish design and Jewish art because we, I think we have lost so much of this awareness of what happened. And one of the eras that's um, most interesting to me is this period from, I'd say about 1890 to 1930, where you have Jews who are recently emancipated who are thinking about what does it mean to be Jews in the modern era and also as full citizens of all of the countries that we are now full citizens of in uh, in Germany and Austria and France and England and uh, and Poland, and if we are the you know, best and brightest of Warsaw and Odessa and Paris, how do we show that through our work and how do we engage with it? Um, and all of these, I think, largely forgotten artists um, from this period, I think, whose work 100 years ago still looks relevant, still looks current, still looks you know beautiful. Um, and so to, to share some of that wealth, because this is all of our heritage. Uh, uh, yes, I, I would, oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, and in addition to that, sort of the usurping by the Eastern Europeans of pretty much, you know, like Eastern European Jewry has the market, right, on, on the history. Yeah. It's a, so not much of the Mizrahi history really gets known in the greater world. Yeah, very true. Can I say something? Hi. Um, I'm, my name is Esti uh, Kreisman. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation. And I wanted to ask if you, you started out as a, as a graphic designer because your, your work, uh, your, the way you uh, look at the text and, and the, the, the letters, you, uh, not as an absolute. Like an olive is always an olive, but it's not really. It's it's something else. It's a it's not an absolute. I, I, I identify very much with your work because I started out also as a graphic designer, um, and it affects everything that I do. And, and I see it the way you you you, you take it also. Uh, everything is basically a, a graphic design, and but it's but there are no absolutes there. That's what's so exciting about your work. That there's no absolutes in the letter. Yeah, and I, I love working with typography because it's exactly that. I think there's endless potential there. That when, when we think about how to represent, you know, a landscape or a building or a person, um, you're starting with a, a certain kind of visual representation and to make sure that your 
um, the representation is accurate, the likeness is accurate, or and then use that as a jumping off point for stylization. I think when you're working with letters to start with, you begin from a point of complete and total abstraction and to then work backwards and say, well, if this is the, this is the skeleton for what a letter is, and this is a skeleton for what you know, a word could look like or uh, the building blocks of an alphabet, how can you use that to start and then build interesting creative work from that point forward? And so I think as, uh, as a graphic designer, that's, I think, continually a fun challenge and why I love the work that I do. Um, but beyond that, I think that within Judaism, as we were just speaking about, that I think there's um, uh, a limitation that a lot of people have of what Jewish art looks like. And uh, Jewish art, I think in large part today, especially in the United States, um, and to I even say a significant extent in Israel, um, is uh, paintings of, the, of Jerusalem and portraits of rabbis. Um, and this is something that uh, the Jewish art salon works very, very hard to combat um, and to engage all kinds of people with all kinds of different visions for what Jewish art is. Um, but when I think about what rep representation looks like in a Jewish art context, um, to me, working with Jewish texts is a way to link all Jews together throughout time and space because that's a commonality in a way that, um, that formats of um, you know, particular ritual objects or representations of how, um, how Jews look. So if I'm doing, you know, if you do a portrait of someone with a black hat and a beard, that's a very specific representation of what, what Jewish looks like. And I think breaking away from that and focusing, and my solution to that is by focusing on, on text um, and other certain rituals to say like, this is a thing that all of us can connect with and all of us can engage with. Um, and that there's no barrier here. There's no, um, I'm not reflecting back anyone else's preconceived ideas of what Jewish looks like. Um, and so I think you've hit on exactly what I'm, I'm trying to achieve in this work. Yes, I, I love it. I love it. It's very inspiring. Thank you. Hill, you know, if I could jump in for a second, because you said something that I find very um, interesting. You said that when you do text-based work, then this helps break down all barriers and everyone can relate to it in a comfortable way and be occupying their space as a Jew within it. And I just find it funny because I also do mostly text-based work and it's mostly using Arabic. Um, and with a similar aim of saying, we're, we're gonna change the perception publicly of what Jewish means and what Jewish looks like. Um, and making people kind of feel comfortable or more used to seeing Arabic in a Jewish context. But it's funny because in doing that, I actually, um, it's unfortunate, but it's just reality that I do put some people off because they're so not used to it and so not okay with Arabic being a Jewish, part of the Jewish story that even just simply using text, I've had protests against my work in the street. You shouldn't write that. You should take that down. That should be painted over. Support also, but that, that is also even though it's just text. So there are some texts that you can put out there that make people feel the opposite, which is just yeah. interesting. Well, and I'll, I'll take that a step further that um, I think what I'm trying to achieve by putting Hebrew up is to say that, is to hope at least that this is a, a baseline that all Jews can connect with. But I have painted, uh, have painted pieces in places where the level of Jewish knowledge is low and um, the people in charge of those spaces were concerned that doing something in Hebrew was off, could be off-putting to people. It's crazy! <laughs> right, to people who might feel self-conscious about um, not being able to understand the work um, or to think that um, making specifically an ostentatiously Jewish work um, by making something large format, large, super large scale in Hebrew in a public space is exclusionary of people who are not Jewish at all. Um, which I find totally bizarre, especially as someone from a, uh, a multicultural city of why are other people allowed to do this? It's almost like every other, every other community is allowed to be like, we're here and we're proud of it and this is what we are and everyone enjoy and we're presenting ourselves except not Jews, ever. Yes. Like, so, ah, I'm not, I'm not though. <laughs> yeah, and so part of the idea is to, is to put the Hebrew in front of them to say that I don't care if you can read this, every piece that I've done in Hebrew has a key on it that has in much more legible Hebrew and also next to it in translation what the piece is of to make sure that there's barriers to entry. 
but then also to confront them with the Hebrew and to think that, oh, this isn't scary, that this is here, that these are also people that I can engage with, that I can have a conversation with, that I can acknowledge as being my neighbors and my, uh, you know, my co-citizens in this city um, and in this world. And so to use art as that bridge to connect people and cultures in a way that- And, it's, uh, and it becomes an educational tool because you need the translation. Yeah. And you need, it's like a whole, it's not-